and we're live. All right. Welcome back. Anybody who's been playing along with us for the last couple weeks, uh, this is the Talking Average Fitness Podcast. As always, my name is Sam Burns, and I'm joined by my compatriot, Mr. Kevin McCarthy. Kevin, how are you today, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Sam, how are you? I'm killing it. Loving it. Absolutely crushing things, uh, including life. So awesome. we got to the end of our uh, podcast last week. We were talking about why people train. You know, like, why do you do what you do when you go inside of a CrossFit gym? And <clears throat> we were settling on a thing that it comes up a lot in our discussions. It comes up a lot in discussion with, I mean, I know for me and my clients and my athletes inside of the affiliate, always trying to be mindful of, well, do I need to do more? And, you know, how do I reach my goals? And um, I only did one workout today is, you know, am I going to get better? And you know, talking about volume in training, uh, and especially as a means to achieve goals. And mm -hmm. we both referenced uh, a classic article from the CrossFit Journal 2016. Um, it's called A Deft Dose of Volume, written by Mr. James Hobart, who is, you know, longtime uh, CrossFit seminar staff, Flowmaster, um, also, you know, multiple time CrossFit game competitor and not just like hey he went to the games no like podiumed many times <laughs> he's a guy mm -hmm. who knows what he's talking about not just from a competitive side but from the methodology side mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully some people who listen to this got a little impetuous and they clicked the link that were in the show notes and they went and they they read the article right but if they didn't that's why we're here so mm -hmm. the article is called again De a deft dose of volume and it talks about um, how or why athletes might add volume to their training. And as we are wont to do, we like definitions in CrossFit. So when we talk about volume, my air quotes, mm -hmm. how are we defining volume here, Mr. Kevin? So uh, there's a few different ways people can think of volume. If we look at kind of traditional strength and conditioning, um, volume is basically load times reps and you'd get like a certain poundage that would be like your total volume for said lift or said session. Um, volume, if you're looking from like kind of an endurance standpoint would be like the total distance you've covered, um, and whether over like a single effort or multiple efforts over the course of your session. Um, when we think about volume in CrossFit, like all those things, like they, they are volume, um, you know, load repetitions, things like that. But what we're going to talk about today is, is volume in the sense of number of training pieces, both over the course of a training session, a training day. And then, you know, if you look big picture, it'd be kind of like volume over the course of a week. Um, so it's basically the number of training pieces that you are doing um, would be your total volume for that again training session your training day or your training week mm -hmm. um so that's what we're looking at and what we're talking about so if as we're going through our uh this episode and you're hearing us talk about volume like we're specifically referencing the number of training pieces um over the course of your your day and we'll kind of keep it mostly there okay i think that's <clears throat> it's really really important for us to kind of highlight that um so kind of steering to the article. The article is a fantastic PDF. It's multiple pages. It's not like 20 pages. It's like six pages. Yeah, it's like five or um, six, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a short but dense piece. And there are a couple things that, you know, as I'm looking at the article, my eye is kind of called to a bunch of spaces already. And the, and the first one right on page two is this big black box with white text. And it says, it is a fool's errand cram multiple workouts on top of each other in hopes of finding a shortcut to fitness. Boom. Mic yeah. drop. End of yeah. the article. Done. Right? Okay. Like, <laughs> so that's, that's a bold statement. You know, yeah. and like, I'm not I'm applying no judgment. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a strong statement to make. It's fool's errand to cram multiple workouts on top of each other in hopes of finding a shortcut to fitness. And I think there's some important definitions here. Like, He's saying multiple workouts. He's not, for example, saying accessory work or right. um, a skill piece, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, we, b prior to hitting record on this, you know, you were talking about accessory work and examples of accessory work, mm -hmm. things that 
you can absolutely participate in and it's not going to be detrimental. I'd love for you to like recall some of those for anyone who might be listening. Yeah. I mean, I, another section in the article, I have no idea what page it's on, but um, it's, he, he goes into that, you know, when we're looking at starting to dive into whether it's, you want to train more just because you really enjoy it and you want to see improvement in these things, or you want to start competing in local competitions, improve your placement in the open, whatever your goals might be. Um, you know, James goes on to say in the article that the majority of athletes are going to find adequate preparation in your kind of one intense effort per day and then targeted skill work. And it's phrased exactly that way is that your the majority of your athletes are going to find adequate preparation for any fitness endeavor, be it competitive or not, um, in one intense effort per day and then targeted skill work. Um, so when it comes to adding training volume on, mm -hmm. there's a way you can kind of progress through it, um, both in terms of adding on to the day. And then if you look at, again, the course of the week. So in the article, he has two examples laid out and he does use the uh, kind of standard three on one off format that we see on CrossFit.com to kind of explain this, but you can kind of layer on these um, like principles in whatever your training schedule is. As you go through, we'll start out like kind of like how we add would it add start the start adding training volume on in a day. So let's right. say you're the athlete that comes in, you take classes, make the assumption that we're at an affiliate that's implementing CrossFit in a traditional sense. It's not doing multiple workouts, you're not having three pieces, you just have your one main training piece, an adequate warm up training piece, cool down, good to go. If you're an athlete that wants to start adding training volume onto that, the way you start to bridge the gap and become the athlete that can handle a little bit more volume is by adding in low intensity accessory work. And what that could look like is, let's say you've done, let's say the workout of the day is Diane, deadlifts, handstand pushups, 2159, that's your workout. You've gone through, you've warmed up adequately, you've built up to that workout weight, you smash the workout, go through a little cool down, if you were to add some accessory on there, when I say low intensity accessory work, I mean, you're going through, let's say three sets of 10 hip extensions on a GHD okay. and a 30 second hollow hold, mm -hmm. something like that. And you're yeah. resting in between sets as needed to maintain quality. It takes, let's say 10 to 15 minutes at the most. And you're going at an intensity that would allow you, like if you and I were doing this accessory piece together, we could just have a nice chat as we're going through. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we mean by kind of low intensity accessory. And that's where you start. And the way you start that is by add that in one to two days mm -hmm. per week. Look at your training week. So if you're, you know, if we take the stereotypical training uh, schedule that has worked its way into CrossFit. Yep. You know, you have basically Thursdays and Sundays as rest days. So you train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rest Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yep. On Monday and Friday, add in some of that low intensity accessory. See how your body reacts to that. If you're able to maintain sufficient intensity, movement mechanics, loading, yada, 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 through your kind of normal training, and you add in those and you're able to maintain that, then maybe add a third day, right. let that marinate for a while. Then you can start to add a fourth day, let that marinate. But then once you get to the point where the only thing you're adding is that low intensity accessory, and that's gonna do a couple things for you. One, it's gonna start to get your body into the rhythm of getting used to training a little bit extra. Like, hey, I've put in my effort here, but now I'm gonna put in a little bit more effort on this. Yep. It's gonna get kind of your body used to that. Um, and it's going to start to make it. So it's also going to make it so you can, um, if you add in some really targeted accessory stuff, you know, you're going to build up some supporting musculature, maybe some supporting movement patterns that are going to help keep you healthier. Um, like stuff like that. If, again, we look at the, the hip extensions, hollow holds, great midline strength, hamstring, glute, low back strength, stuff oh, yeah. that you need not only for 
really quality workouts, but also just life in general. Having a stronger midline and stronger posterior chain is not going to make you a less healthy human being. Right. Um, so adding stuff like that is kind of the first step um, to effectively starting to ramp up your volume in training. And I, I love the language that you used when you talked about this, right? So again, going back to the class structure, single workout of the day, let's say workout of the day is Diane, 2159, deadlift handstand pushup. Your language was smash the workout, mm -hmm. right? So you bring an appropriate level of intensity to that main training piece. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift to something else to highlight this, but it should be said that even if you know, like you walk into the class and written on the whiteboard is Diane and then post-workout or after party, three sets, hip extensions and GHDs, you don't attack Diane and save yourself a little bit so that you've got, mm -hmm. you can go like for time, three sets of GHDs and hip extensions or hollow holes, yeah. whatever. Yep. It's crush the workout get an appropriate level of intensity for that workout. Mm -hmm. And then after you've recovered a little bit, right, you're adding that little bit, that little bit of extra lower intensity um, mm -hmm. work on top of that. And I highlight that because in the article, it's got this great little quote, don't mistake volume and intensity and end up training for 90 minutes at 60% when 60 minutes at 90% might have been more valuable, right? Mm -hmm. I yep. kind of like under like simmering underneath all this discussion stuff in terms of adding volume is maintaining that appropriate intensity for the workouts still, right? And the people who, uh, it says somewhere else in the article, the people who are doing these extra training sessions at higher levels, your, you know, your semifinals and your uh, CrossFit Games level athletes, they operate on the daily at level of intensity that, you know, is of course supported by fantastic mechanics and consistency, but it's, mm -hmm. they're not gaining any one of their pieces. They're attacking each one of these, right? Right. And so yep. if and the goal is to increase the volume accordingly. We don't want to sacrifice that. Right. I, I, I really agree with that because as this is kind of like a little, um, way you can kind of check in with if, if what you're doing, cause we're going to kind of talk through how to kind of progress things through and, and add things on smartly. But, um, as we're kind of going through, that's just one way you can kind of check in with yourself. If you find yourself and you have to be a little bit kind of self-aware with this, yeah. if you find yourself mid workout, let's say I'm doing Diane, right. I'm doing the workout and I have the capacity. Let's just assume I have the capacity to do the workout or the deadlift, let's say, Mm -hmm. unbroken, right? I can do the 21, 15 and nine unbroken on my deadlifts. If I find myself in the set of 21 being like, I should save myself or break this up or slow down because I have this coming up next. Mm -hmm. That extra volume that you're thinking about tacking on as you're wanting to do is no longer serving you and is no longer appropriate on that day. Yeah. And we're going to go into a bunch of nuancey type stuff um, with the training volume thing. But that's just one way that I found just in my journey as a semi-competitive athlete in CrossFit is if I find myself during a workout being like, oh, I should probably back off a little bit or, oh, I should probably break this up so I don't, you know, so I have the energy to do this next piece. Yeah. As soon as I catch myself thinking that, because I would do that for a while, like, hey, you know, I should, I should probably save myself. I've got this next one coming up. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I have, you know, a second, third training piece coming up. Like, I, I should save myself. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten to a point for the past few years, probably two, three years, where as, as soon as that thought would start to creep into my head, I would just, I would chuck that extra training piece out. I'd be like, let, yeah. let me finish this workout, cross that off the list. Yeah as long as I did it with sufficient intensity, rest as I need. And if I still have some left in the tank for that training piece, like cool. Yeah. But if not, you can always maybe adjust it. Maybe instead of being a, another conditioning piece, you adjust it to a for quality piece. Like, you know, you yeah. can move these things around and I know we're, I know we're gonna dive into it, but that was kind of always my way and, and a cool way I think that hopefully anyone that's listening, you can start to check in with yourself. If you do do, uh, do do. Uh. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> 
and or 12. So, uh, yep, pretty much. Um, if you are someone that does multiple training pieces per day and you find yourself mid-workout constantly being like, oh, I should probably back off a bit so I can save myself for this, it's no longer appropriate and it's not going to serve you well to do that extra training piece. You should put more of your eggs in the basket of the piece you're doing now, get the most out of that rather than getting 60% out of both, if that makes sense. So that, that's a, a way to kind of think about that and, and have that kind of check in is, is this still serving me? Yeah. And I, I, I love that we can kind of highlight that from the get go, you know, and, mm -hmm. and again, that these things like this, some of the stuff that we're saying is backed up by, you know, what is written in the article. For example, if your athletes require frequent scaling, extra workouts are not the solution. Similarly, if your athletes struggle with mechanics, then once again, adding volume still isn't the answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we've covered mechanics, we've covered consistency, and of course, now we want to make sure that we're keeping mm -hmm. intensity up as well. Yep. So, okay, so talking about volume, then, there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways that we can start to add in volume that is not just mm -hmm. an accessory piece a little yep. like a finisher or a, a pump session, something like that, that is just kind of like fun, right? Mm -hmm. Let's assume then that I've been coming to CrossFit consistently. That means mm -hmm. three or more days a week at the minimum mm -hmm. for probably a couple years, yep. right? Um, I have been coached and I have implemented the feedback from my coach. And as a result, I have taken myself from wherever I was when I first walked in the door to hopefully a better movement pattern, not just across one or two things, but across all of my pieces, right? All of my workouts, mm -hmm. my modalities. I'm ready to, I think I'm ready to start adding something a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. yep. What's next? So, you know, I, I, just want to touch on an important point that you just made was the, the movement mechanics. Mm -hmm. If you don't move well, and this is just a statistic here is if, if you start, if you go from one workout a day to two workouts a day, you've just doubled your risk for injury, just yeah. statistically yeah. It's easy math. If you don't move well, meaning in a way that's safe, effective, and efficient mm -hmm. for insert, whatever movement here, if you don't move well, doing more of that, is just going to more ingrain some shitty movement patterns and it's going to become increasingly harder to fix that yeah. prime example this guy right here <laughs> it's i'm it's the reason i'm dealing with my hip injury is uh, okay. i was the, i was the person and i'll fully admit this right mm -hmm. again like in my attempt to like i need to go faster heavier more to try mm -hmm. and compete in crossfit I'm a very quad dominant athlete just by nature. Yeah. Um, before I had ever done a barbell squat, if you had looked at my quads, you would assume I could squat 300 pounds. I've always had pretty large legs. I've used my quads for pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. So the way I would manage anything, as soon as I get tired, as soon as something got hard or heavy, yeah. just jam my knees forward, come up on my toes and use the quads that the Lord gave me. Right. And so... <laughs> Um, for probably the better part of two or three years of training, I don't think my heels ever touched the floor. Um, in anything could be a deadlift, wow. could be a pull-up. My heels never touched the floor. It right. didn't matter. And so because of that, the musculature of my hips and lower back and everything didn't get strong in that position. As soon as I decided to try and fix it, I tried to fix it doing some, like doing some back squats. I'm like, I'm going to fix this. You know, it's, it's, it's not a great movement pattern. Let's try and fix it. Let's fix it. So, under load. <laughs> yeah, it, exact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Sure. Um, so I'm shitty at let's, this. Let's, let's yeah. lift heavy and fix it. I'm, I'm real bad at this. So let's put, you know, 70% on the bar and try and fix it. And so, um, and so my lower back ended up somewhere on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and here we are. So it's I did it to myself. It's some yeah. poor movement patterns. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Like I'm an example of it, which is why I feel like I have a pretty good platform to talk about it. I've, I've been there. I've done it. Um, and it's one of those things where, again, if, if you're not moving properly, mm -hmm. just adding on more. And it, it is just – it's a gamble. It's going to happen eventually. At some point, you're going to get injured. Yeah. You know, it took me – probably two to two and a half years to sustain like a major injury, um, which is what I'm dealing with now. Yep. 
it's different for everyone, yep. but you know, it's, I was, I guess, lucky in the sense that while I was going through poor movement patterns in the volume, like I was younger and the younger you are, the more kind of indestructible you are and the more you <laughs> kind of handle it for a while. Yeah. Um, which then makes it more dangerous because you're like, ah, oh, like I'm good to go. Right. Um, so that point about mechanics, if you're not moving well, like you have to move well to earn the right to train more. Let's just put that there. I, I, As we start to, hang yeah. On, before, you, before you go any further, I think it's really, really important to highlight what you just said. Mm -hmm. You have to earn the right. Yep. And I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I want to make sure that it's said that we're not, like we're not misusing that phrase in the sense that like we're not trying to say that anyone is better than or worse than or greater than or lesser than or anything yep. like that. That's not the way this works. What we're trying to do is as professionals, we're talking about, you know, for example, let's use the pull up as an example, right? If you cannot do a strict pull up, I'm not going to teach you how to do a kipping pull up. And it's not because I don't want you to know how to do pull ups. Mm -hmm. It's because without having developed through strict strength adaptation, the stability and the capability to control your body, you know, the full load of your body through your shoulder and up into your arm and your elbow and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you have not developed that, it is irresponsible of me to teach you how to flail about at full body weight underneath mm -hmm. the bar. Right. Um, yep. And so when we talk about earning it, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Right. Mm -hmm. We're talking about responsible training and how to progress in a responsible way, responsible way that hopefully doesn't put you in the hurt locker like Kevin mm -hmm. is talking about right now. Yep. And I mean, it, something that I've, I've heard Austin say a lot is most mm -hmm. people's ceilings are limited by their mechanics, not their capacity. Um, if, if you have greater, it's a great line, right? I got to think um, about that one for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Like most people's ceilings are limited by their mechanics and not their capacity or potential capacity, however you want to kind of phrase that, right? Most people could probably go super bonkers moving like a bag of hammers rolling down the stairs and get something <laughs> done really quickly. <laughs> a bag of hammers rolling down the stairs. The thing is now everyone listening has a visual of that and it makes sense. Um, so, but most people go bonkers and they get something done really, really fast, but is it going to serve them? Most people, again, we'll come back to this would be like better served trying to move better, more efficiently in a certain movement as opposed to adding on extra training. Right. Um, but let's assume that we have an athlete that has – They've come through, they've been doing CrossFit consistently three to five days a week. Their movement mechanics are consistent and sound across all of their movements. They have requisite strength yeah. um, and endurance and yada, yada, yada to have kind of earned the right to start tacking on some extra training. Yeah. The kind of pathway you'd go through as we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier is you start with that low intensity accessory work and it should kind of serve and kind of go along with the day mm -hmm. um, that you've done. Um, and it doesn't take much more than like 10 to 15 minutes, but it kind of adds on that accessory piece. And you start laying on, start with one day, let it marinate. Yep. And when I say let it marinate, I say like, you know, I'd say four to eight weeks, depending on who you are and you can kind of play around with it, but it's like letting it marinate is like more than just like, okay, it's been three days. I'll let it marinate. Nope. Yeah give it at least a solid four weeks of just adding in that one day of accessory then add a second day then a third day progress through once you're at the point where you're doing accessory all three to five of your training days yep. you've got that accessory work in there to kind of support your musculature and everything else once you're there okay then you can take one of those accessory sessions mm -hmm. the way i would go about is turn that into a low intensity skill session choose a skill that's kind of a targeted weakness for you. Mm -hmm. And when I say skill, this might blow some people's mind that yeah. can include the barbell. Yeah. Um, and so choose a movement that you need to work on from a skill perspective. And again, making it lower intensity. Yes. And when I say lower intensity, it's not an EMOM. You're not adding another workout that just has this movement in it. 
Yeah. It's really hard to work on your pull-up mechanics in Fran because the intensity yeah. is way too high for you to focus on the mechanics part of it. You're yes. too concerned with trying to die instead of PR. Yeah. So you're taking the workout or the workout, the movement and removing it from any ounce of intensity. Right. And what that might look like is let's take the pull-up, for example. You're going to do five sets mm -hmm. of five pull-ups. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's assume a gymnastic kip or a butterfly because that'd be more the skill aspect. Sure. You're going to do five sets of five pull-ups mm -hmm. resting as needed in like at least two minutes in between. And your yeah. goal is to make each set of five pull-ups the most perfect pull-ups mm -hmm. in the entire world. Yeah. You know, um, and, and that's what we mean by low intensity skill work. If we're looking at it from a barbell perspective, let's just say snatch, because mm -hmm. that's the movement that everyone loves to hate and has sure. a love hate relationship with. Oh yeah. You're going to take a PVC pipe mm -hmm. or at the most an empty barbell. Yeah. And you're going to work positions and mechanics mm -hmm. and you're going to work on your timing and you're going to slow down your pull. You're going to pause in the bottom of that overhead squat and show me active shoulders and knees out and a beautiful, you know, yeah. bottom position for your snatch. Yeah. And it's like, that's the low intensity practice. Yeah. Doing a 10 minute EMOM of three snatch to 70% is not <laughs> low intensity skill work for that movement. Same as doing a 10 minute EMOM of 10 pull-ups is not low intensity skill work. Yeah. I'm talking about, again, same ideas we had for the accessory work. Mm -hmm. If you and I are going through this together, we're mm -hmm. like, hey, Sam, let's practice our pull-ups today. Mm -hmm. We're going to do five sets of five pull-ups. Like we should be able to just, we're just carrying on a conversation as we rest between sets. Mm -hmm. You know, we're watching each other do our pull-ups and maybe giving each other some pointers and the whole deal. That's me my low intensity skill work. I, I think we can also put some definitions to some of this. You've, you've done a great job of kind of differentiating between accessory work and skill work, right? Mm -hmm. so accessory work, the example, again, GHD hip extension and hollow hold, we're talking about low intensity and also low skill requirement, right? Yep. Now moving mm -hmm. into skill work, still low intensity, low intensity, slightly higher skill requirements, so slightly higher neurological yep. load, right? Yep. We're defining load and low intensity as a bunch of different ways we can define it, but I, Ben Bergeron has a, a great breakout that I've used for athletes before. This would not be what we would call training, right? Mm -hmm. So he has a couple major groups. There's practice, there's training, and there's competition, right? Yep. What we want to try to achieve kind of on the daily inside of that single workout of the day is training, right? Competition is a whole other beast. We're not going to talk about that for today, right? Practice yep. is something that, uh, a label that we can apply to the skill work or the accessory work. Yep. We can define it as less than 50% of one rep max, very, very manageable load. Uh, the yep. heart rate never gets above 60%, right? Mm -hmm. Your level of focus is very, very, very high, right? Mm -hmm. And your the demand on you physically is correspondingly very low. Mm -hmm. Because for you to bring the neurological capacity to bear on this skill work, this thing that you want to get better at, you cannot raise the intensity a certain level. You cannot have your heart rate spike super hard, right? Because right. You know, I like to joke about it. The moment the heart rates start to rise, the IQs start to fall, right? We, we, we just, we can't Accurate. think critically, you know, at max heart rate. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> so I love, you know, we can kind of outline these two things and mm -hmm. especially like active shoulders and empty barbell and the snatch. I mean, you want to get better at your snatch, spend 10 seconds in the bottom of an overhead squat with an empty barbell mm -hmm. and just, you know, learn to love that position, you know? Um, yep. And, and I think one of the best ways to improve your skill on a movement, and again, we'll use the snatch as a, as a, as an example <laughs> is to get comfortable in those positions. Yeah. You know, some of the best skill work you can do for your snatch, accumulate five minutes in the bottom of a PVC overhead squat. Oh, horrible. If you're doing it properly, you're terrible. And I mean, it's, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like some of the guys at Misfit Athletics or, or a fan of them at all, but they're a smart group of guys. They have one of the better competitor programs in my mind, um, that's available out there. And one of their coaches, Hunter is incredibly blunt and I love it. Um, <laughs> and so they're talking, I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> he was talking about, um, 
uh, they were talking about like athletes in, in certain positions. Um, I forget the episode, the name of the episode. If I, if I find it, I'll have to send it to you. Cause you'd really yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. And he was like, they were like, Oh yeah. Like most people, you know, most athletes like aren't super comfortable in the bottom of a squat. And he chimes in, he goes, that's because most athletes haven't seen the bottom of the squat. So like, why would you be comfortable there? It's right. like, you've never been below parallel once in your life. Why would you right. be comfortable there? Why would you be strong there? Right. And I was like, Oh, savagery. But obviously there's a little bit accurate. of hyperbole there, it's, but yes. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it goes to show like if, if you're like, Hey, I'm just not comfortable with the squat snatch. Well, how good is your yeah. overhead squat? Yeah. If the overhead squat you show me has you shaking like a leaf in mm -hmm. a breeze mm -hmm. and you're with an empty bar, like, well, yeah, of course your squat snatch isn't going to feel great or look great. And you're not going to be confident in that lift because you haven't developed sufficient stability, comfort, strength in that bottom position. Yeah. If you can show me someone who has a rock solid bottom position for an overhead squat and I'll use a PVC pipe. Yes. The PVC pipe is a phenomenal tool for exposing these things in yourself because it does not care. Um, it, it, <laughs> if, if you've taken a level one seminar, you know how humbling the, that eight ounces of terror can be. <laughs> um, of terror. Yep. It really, it is. Um, wow. Because like if you're using an empty bar or even a light barbell, there's some load there that can either a push you into position or you can kind of use it to push against to maybe rotate your shoulders into a more optimal position or something. Provides that you, you a little maybe, bit of feedback. Yeah. A little bit of feedback you can like, you can push against and rotate against and the whole thing. Yeah. But if you can do that with a PVC pipe, then you have achieved some like true mastery over those positions. If you have a really good PVC overhead squat. So, mm -hmm. um, again, like the, the, the skill portion for the lifting is like master those positions, Yeah, you know, create mastery in the bottom of that PVC overhead squat, the bottom of a front squat, you know, the like different positions in the pull. And like, that's how you can start to integrate skill work with your barbell and start to move the needle on those. Again, if we're chucking it in the bin of practice, right. Um, and, so, and, not, and not to just provide people, and I feel, I feel like this happens a lot, so I want to make sure that I address it, not to provide mm -hmm. people with barbell-only examples, right? Right. For those mm -hmm. of you who want to work on your gymnastics, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, have someone educate you about what a virtuous hollow position looks like, right? Um, and again, you know, to piggyback on that bottom of the squat thing, very rarely... Have mm -hmm. I come across an athlete who understands what a virtuous hollow position looks like without having had a coach correct them into that position, either inside of a CrossFit gym or having a previous experience as a gymnast of some kind. Um, right. And so once you understand what a hollow position looks like, what it feels like to hold that mm -hmm. position, then say you want to develop your, your kip underneath the bar, the beat swing, right? Mm -hmm. Hop on a bar, super aggressive grip. For those of you who are watching, when I say aggressive grip, I mean top row, knuckles facing the sky, thumb wrapped around the bar, right? Oh, so you're one of those. I absolutely am. Until Thumbless day, I, grip all day, baby. Oh, suicide grip. Oh, so yeah. I'll come back to this in a second. So <laughs> aggressive grip on the bar, knuckles facing yep. forward. Come down, full extension. So you're at the bottom of the thing. And then just press your midline into hollow, hold accumulate it's so hard it's so it's ridiculously hard right but that's yep. the gymnastic equivalent mm -hmm. of the bottom of the overhead squat yep. with the pvc, Use that PVC. yep right? exactly and if you want to make it even harder go from hollow back to neutral and then show me arch just press and hold into that arch oh. show me the same level of virtuosity right yep it's and the that's the hardest how we, thing you'll ever do <laughs> it is and it's and again going back to your to use your word master right Yep. How mm -hmm. we exhibit mastery is concentric and eccentric portions of a movement look the same under mm -hmm. control with no load. Right? And then yep. as we ascend load or as we ascend leverage, mastery is defined the same way. Um, yep. Real quick though, real quick, for those of you who are on one side or the other of Kevin, I's Kevin and I's debate about the thumb around the bar, here's my challenge. If you think your grip strength is that good, please feel free to go do a couple of legless rope climbs and not wrap your thumb around the rope. If you can do that, I will, I will back off and say, yes, you in particular don't have to wrap your thumbs around a bar. 
But anyone who's been in one of my classes in the last couple of years knows that I'm a hawk about that shamelessly. All right. Remind me to never work out with you and do pull-ups ever. <laughs> um, That's what I'm here for. But uh, as we kind of cruise along, again, let's say we have this athlete that has the requisite strength and, mm -hmm. and they've moved well in the whole thing. They started with the accessory work. They then start to layer on the skill work. Yep. You start to layer in, you know, take one accessory session, add in that low intensity skill session, and you kind yes. of build that up. So it goes, you know, you have one day of low access or low intensity skill, the rest are all accessory. And mm -hmm. then you go two and three and you kind of layer it on the same way. Um, once you're there, then you can start looking at, and I would kind of put these as relatively equal. Again, if we look at kind of progressing along, adding volume in CrossFit is either building capacity in a gymnastics movement yep. or barbell movement or building strength yep. in a bar, you know gymnastics movement or barbell movement. And I'd put those kind of like, it depends on what you need to work on. You know, there are some athletes that come into CrossFit and they're like, you know, I can, I, this is just me making something up. I don't think there'd be a human like this, but let's just for a sake of example, I can back squat 400 pounds, right. but I can't do 10 unbroken thrusters with a 95 pound bar. Right. It's like, okay, cool. So you have incredible strength. You don't really need to work on that anymore. Yeah. You're lacking the capacity. Right. Then there are some people on the other side of the spectrum who's like, hey, I can do 50 unbroken thrusters with a 95 pound bar, but my best back squat is also 95 pounds. Right. Again, I'm making something up. That's not a realistic scenario, but like for the sake of the argument, it sure. two ends this spectrum. For sure. So depending on which way you need to go. And for most people, you're going to fall somewhere in the middle. So you can kind of like do a little bit of both, yep. but you would do the same thing. You now have your five days that you're doing low intensity skill work, mm -hmm. sub in one day of either the capacity or strength building, where now we're shifting away from practice and moving into the training bucket yep. where we're increasing something physiologically within the tissue yep. to be able to either produce more force or the same amount of force more times. Elicit um, an adaptation of some kind. Yep. So, the, and you're just going to wash, rinse, repeat, you know, you start adding in those things. Once you've gone through that whole thing of like, again, if you're, if we're looking at building capacity you're building strength, you're taking that movement, that loading range, that rep range, whatever you want to call it, you're taking that outside of a workout to work on it. So I'm not doing a workout with heavy thrust uh, or heavy front squats. I'm just working on heavy front squats. Yes. You know, I'm not doing a workout with moderate load touch and go power cleans. I'm working on moderate load touch and go power clean. So you're still removing it from the workout in this instance. Yes. Um, and what that allows you to do is again, target that weakness. Everyone has different strength and weaknesses. And if you have a good coach in your life or good relationship, it's an objective mm -hmm. outside party that can be like, no, you don't need to work on strength anymore, Sam. You're plenty good at lifting. You need to work on your this. Yes. Um, but what that looks like is instead of, uh, again, if we use kind of the, the pull up in the snatch as the example, which we kind of been going back and forth mm -hmm. on, if we use the pull up as the example, instead of doing five sets of five with two minutes rest in between focusing on the quality, yep. once you have the quality movement, your butterfly pull ups are dialed in. Cool. Now you're going to do a 10 minute EMOM of 10 butterfly pull ups. And then mm -hmm. what that does is now you're going to be under a slight amount of fatigue because you're not going to be fully recovered from the previous set going to the next set. Yeah. So you're building capacity, mm -hmm. muscle endurance, the whole deal within that. Once you've, you're good to go there, you're like, okay, I can do 100 of the most perfect pull-ups under that fatigue. Mm -hmm. How likely that is? Probably not. Like if, but for the sake of the argument, yep. then the next step to that kind of like the, if that's like, option one and you have yep. like option one a kind of like a little progression from that is mm -hmm. okay now you're going to do five rounds yeah or maybe not five rounds every two minutes for yep. five sets so same time domain 10 minutes right mm -hmm. every two minutes for five sets you're going to do a 10 calorie row 10 pull-ups mm -hmm. which now you're working on oh i know right it's fantastic it is really but, good isn't it great the way my mind works? It's fantastic. If it's anyone wants program, if anyone wants amazing programming, <laughs> hit me up. I got you. Um, and so uh, that's kind of like option one. How can I progress further from there? So now you're working on again 
pull up endurance and, yeah. and muscle endurance capacity, yeah. but now under pre fatigue, yeah. because the row is going to inter interfere with the pull, but also mm -hmm. your heart rate is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. You have a limited window to work in. So you can't just have the 10 calorie row take seven days and then right. get up on your pull up bar. Good to go. Right. Um, so that's kind of the deal there. If we look at the snatch side of things that can look like, um, you know, six by three squat snatch at 70% and you're building strength there. Mm -hmm. Or if we go to the capacity side of things, um, you're doing a 10 minute EMOM of three touch and go squat snatches at, it's probably gonna be lighter than 70%, but you're gonna do, you're working on your barbell cycling there. Yeah. And then again, if you're looking at it from a capacity standpoint, you know, that's option one is the 10 minute EMOM of just the snatch, you build that up. Once you're good to go there, then you move into the five rounds every two minutes, 10 cal bike, three mm -hmm. squat snatch, you know, whatever. And you're building up the capacity in your legs to be a, still be able to squat snatch under some pre fatigue. And there's, there's a subtle thing that Kevin has woven into. He really does have a good handle on programming and give you a little plug here for ginger, ginger ninja programming. Oh, like, yeah, thanks, bud. <clears throat> there's a subtle thing that he has woven into this. If, if, you, if you're paying attention to what he's describing, he's describing conflicting movements, right? So row interfering with pull-up, bike erg interfering with their legs' ability to generate power for the snatch. He is also satisfying two things. The first is muscle endurance in a targeted muscle group, right? And so you can focus on, you know, I want to get better at my snatch and especially under fatigue, right? but he's doing so in a way that satisfies variance as well. So it's not just do more snatches, it's what's another way we can come at this problem? Because remember, Mother Nature doesn't give two figs if you are just trying to get better at the snatch. Like I'm all mm -hmm. about people wanting to get better at something, but at least for myself, I always wanna bring it back to, you know, variance is super crucial to developing a well-rounded athlete um, and there's a lot of different ways that you could go about that. And that's, that's the fun part. That's the art of programming. There, mm -hmm. there are different ways of doing that, but kind of providing people a little bit of a peek behind the curtain there uh, as you're mm -hmm. describing that. So I think that, yep. you know, another thing that should be said is we've now gone outside of a single 60 minute class, yep. right? So for those of you who are looking at doing this, we've highlighted kind of from the beginning that we want you to come in, we want you to do what you're doing in your affiliate, we want you to chase intensity, you know, get after it. And if you want to have those things, it starts with a little bit of accessory work. It expands into a little bit of skill work. And right about there is, you know, it, that stuff can be worked into a class. It can be done well, especially if your coach understands group management, lesson planning, and, you know, really how to teach C and correct. But once we start getting into like a dedicated lifting session or an endurance piece or something like that, really we've gone outside of the confines of single workout of the day programming inside of a 60 minute class. You're probably looking at um, someone has written for you or you have purchased into some specialized programming of some kind. So mm -hmm. be aware, you know, now it's like 90 minutes that you're mm -hmm. in the gym, right? Yep. Which means there is a lot of room to improve the things that you want to improve and make serious headway. Don't discount accessory work and, you know, um, like skill work. If you really focus, and especially if you're picking those holes in your game, be consistent with that stuff. You can make a lot of headway without ever going outside of that 60 minute time window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we're going to kind of continue to progress along, yes, you're eventually going to get to a point where, it might become reasonable, appropriate, and feasible for you to add in a, and again, this would be like, I would reserve this next step mm -hmm. for the athletes that are confident that you're going to qualify for a multi or a multi event per day mm -hmm. competition. Right. So something like a semifinal, something like a Wadapalooza, something, you know, where the competition is two to four days and you're going to see multiple events per day mm -hmm. is you start to, you add in a second Metcon yeah. you've, you've gone through, you know, you take your class workout, class workouts, Diane, mm -hmm. you crush it again with the sufficient level or appropriate level of intensity. And then your second training piece for that day 
is another Metcon. You know, you go through and you do five rounds, thousand meter concept two bike, 20 wall balls, two rope climbs. Phenomenal I workout. I want to it's, do that. <laughs> it's a great, listen, I'm just giving you people some, some ideas. If that's, everybody write this down. Yeah. It's, every, it's free, free food. Any workouts you. we talk about this show, write it down. Please. Do it. Yeah. And then tag us on Instagram because I want to mm-hmm. see you guys doing it. If you, here's another idea. This is work I, I wrote for myself, did it uh, on no. Tuesday. Yeah. You're looking for, if you're looking to build some leg endurance and to okay. um, get the bitch out of your heart on the machine, <laughs> you're going to do, it's every four minutes okay. for four rounds. Okay. okay. It's for 16 minutes. Every four minutes for four rounds, you're going to do 30 unbroken wall balls. Okay. And 30 calories on the concept two bike. Okay. The caveat being, and this is different for different people, you had to hold a certain pace on the bike. Right. So the idea is, okay, you've created some leg fatigue, Yeah. but now you have to try and hold this pace because it's so easy for me to get on a Concept2 bike and just do nothing and you're going to get some calories. Yeah, just like, ah, I'll just, you know, cruise right along at whatever pace and get the pain out of my legs and we'll be fine. Yeah. But again, now you have the shorter time window. You want to have some rest in there. So it's not just 60 minute AMRAP. So you have to kind of go pretty hard and you find a pace that's appropriate for you and you can adjust the calories. But if you're looking to get a solid quad pump, mm-hmm. it was a great workout. It was, it was everything I needed. I'd, you know, coerce one of my co-coaches Colin into doing it with me. And he was in, incredibly uh, thankful is the word that <laughs> yeah, he appreciated it so much. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it, you know, as we're going through, if, you, if you're one of those athletes, I'd say for most people, the 99.99% of people that, you know, you're not going to a multi-day, multi-event competition, mm-hmm. kind of putting yourself or kind of the, the cap at you do your workout of the day, you do your main training piece, you get the most out of that. And then the rest is targeted weakness work. And again, if you've kind of progressed to the point where it's adding a lift or adding some gymnastics capacity, Mm -hmm. then you're good to go there. You don't need to do two, three, four Metcons per day, every day of the week. Oh God. Yeah. Because it, because life doesn't require that. And also the, whatever level of competition you're going to doesn't require that either. You know, I see athletes, this is something that kind of blows my mind. And I've had the conversation with a few athletes at multiple gyms that are kind of, you know, let's say quarterfinals, for example, okay. or as you're going through, let's say start to the open. Yep. The open is an incredibly low volume. It's almost laughably low volume competition. You're right. talking about one intense effort over the course of seven days. That is incredibly, that is one train, one of your normal training days, right? Yeah. You come in, you crush Diane, the, the one, or let's just say, uh, pick another one. Um, Cindy, cause most open workouts okay. are longer, right? Yep. So let's yep. Cindy, minute, right? you come in, you hit Cindy like that, that, that training day, like that's essentially the volume required of you in the open, likely more so Cindy turns into a pretty high, high volume workout. If you're kind of in the realm of, I'm trying to compete in CrossFit. Um, so that's probably higher volume than what you're going to see in the open. So there's that. I mean, the open again is a super low volume test or low volume event. It's not asking much of you. So if you're sitting there being like, I need to train two, three, four times a day to prepare for the open. Why? The test is not requiring that of you. It's not asking that of you. It's in no way, shape, or form is that going to serve you because likely if you're training four times a day, your overall intensity level is lower and the open is a test of intensity, really. It's how hard can you go once. If we move on from there, and let's say you're an athlete that has gone from the open and we've now qualified for quarterfinals. We're now in the next stage of competition. Welcome back. Thanks, man. Okay. Um, uh, you didn't really miss much just me talking about like the open super low volume. It's just it's yeah. one test. It If you're training three or four times a day, for trying to that. prepare for the open, you're yeah. okay. Fantastic. So let's just say we're the athlete that then you've qualified for quarterfinals. We made it to the next stage of competition. Yeah. 
quarterfinals the past two years. And again, it could change, but mm-hmm. t- the pattern tends to follow. It's been five events, yep. right? But those five events are over the course of four days. Yeah. If you space it, because th- the workouts are usually released by noon on the Thursday, and then you mm-hmm. have until the following Sunday to submit your scores and videos and, and whatever else. Right. So one of those events is a lift. It's going to be a strength test. You know, uh, the first 2021, we had a four rep max front squat, yep. which was the most frustrating thing because who the fuck front squats just for four. Like, I know what <laughs> right? I can do for three. I know what I can do for five. There's the fourth. I'm like, well, <laughs> go for all it. right, then. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, this past year we had uh, the other total, which was, it, it was each had a 10 minute window that you had to do it. But it was a one at max clean, one at max bench, one at max overhead squat. Great test. Um, so, but one of them is a, is a lifting piece and you have four kind of metabolic conditioning tests. Mm-hmm. If you line it up properly, it's still a super low volume demand yeah. on you, right? So you, let's say you, if you line it up properly, you do your lift and then the one conditioning test on Thursday and then Friday, mm-hmm. Saturday, Sunday, you do one of the conditioning tests. You warm up properly, you crush it, you cool down, call it done. Yep. That's four days of essentially one intense effort per day and one lift. Yep. If you ask me, that looks a hell of a lot like just one training week taking class, Yeah. right? Like yeah. that's what that is. It's not asking any more of you from a volume perspective. It's asking for intensity. The open yeah. and quarterfinals are a test of your work capacity and your intensity. Yeah. So if you're trying to tack on more training volume, I'm going to do four Metcons a day for open prep. You are doing yourself a disservice, honestly, yeah. because if you're doing four Metcons a day, your, your intensity level, again, unless you're that games athlete who has trained to the point where they can maintain such a level of intensity over the course of that, mm-hmm. your intensity levels are overall going to be lower yeah. and you're going to have, less in the tank for that one intense effort. And that's where you have the phenomenon of the athlete that trains four hours a day, get absolutely demolished by the athlete that just takes class and goes hard. Right. So once, so again, I would say for those athletes, if you're in the open quarterfinals, whatever, even if you're like, Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm in kind of the top portion of quarterfinals, Mm -hmm. like where myself, like you're in the top 500 of quarterfinals, you're trying to push towards that semifinals level. Yep. You still don't need multiple Metcons per day. Like yeah. you're going to be better served by in trying to improve your strength mm-hmm. or your capacity in whatever movements outside of a workout. So that then hopefully the capacity and the strength that you've built in those, you can then plug back into a workout and use it. You know, if you get better at cycling a barbell, then when it turns into the workout, that's 10 rounds of 10 snatches, 10 burpees over the bar, you can cycle the bar more efficiently. You remember that workout? Yes. Made me want to unalive myself. That was terrible. Um, <laughs> so I, I, as you're talking about this, I was thinking about, you know, you gave some examples talking about qualifying for multi-day type of things before yes. you started yep. to talk about volume. You used mm-hmm. Waza or Wadapalooza as an example. The But, no, you know, we're chiefly, we're talking about the open here, right? Yeah. It should be said that, like, this is not the case with Wadapalooza. Like, you don't get to play at the quarterfinals or semifinals level if you're not RXing the workouts and RXing mm-hmm. at intensity, right? At intensity. Wadapalooza mm-hmm. yep. has a mechanism for, you know, like scaled athletes at a bunch of different tiers, um, which is a, a crap ton of fun, right? Mm-hmm. Where I, as a trainer, have run into the most trouble getting people to buy into and practice this is actually with master's athletes Mm. because I get because of the age range that the athlete happens to exist in the prescribed loading for or prescribed movement standard for uh, a given set of workouts it's you know scaled to appropriately challenge um, a different demographic than the 18 to 55 or you know whatever group Mm -hmm. but that doesn't negate the need for that intensity right and 
if you if you are a master's level athlete out there, and I've had discussions with other athletes about this, and I, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but especially as we are starting to age, and I include myself in this, it's one of the reasons that one of the reasons that I do CrossFit the way that I do is because I want to be able to keep doing CrossFit. Mm -hmm. You know, as as we age, it becomes more important to be mindful of volume and mechanics, quality, virtuosity, <clears throat> than it does. How much work can I throw myself at? And those athletes who do well in the Masters competitions, not only, of course, are they tremendously fit, especially relative to their, to their sex and age range, but they've typically got one or two high-level skills that they have worked and earned, but they don't skimp on the intensity. You know, mm -hmm. they, are, they are still driving at home or each one yep. of those workouts that they're doing. Yep. Yeah. And even if you're looking into a multi-day competition, let's say like we use Wadapalooza, for example, like the qualifying process for Wadapalooza is very similar to the open and that it, it is a test of intensity again. Like to, to qualify for Wadapalooza, it's still a test of intensity. And, uh, you know, if, if you're at the point where you're like, you know, qualifying for the elite division, which is where all the games athletes compete, mm -hmm. it's still a test of intensity. Yeah. You know, like it's, you have to be be able again it's a very high level of intensity that sure. those guys can go at and they can do some incredible things but the the qualifier for that is still a test of intensity it's not a test of volume yeah. until you get there and even when you get there like that when when we qualified a team from one nation and we did uh it was when Wadapalooza was a sanctional during the two years of what the fuck was the game season <laughs> um and Wadapalooza was uh sanctional and sanctionals was, was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like, it was, a uh, two men, two women on a team. Yeah. And, you know, we went down competed in the RX division, had a ton of fun, mm -hmm. but it was still, it was three days and it was two events per day. Yeah. Again, it's still not an absurd test of volume. The, the most yeah. volume you're going to see in a competition anywhere is the CrossFit games where it's like, could be two events per day, could be five. Who knows? Um, and and that's the most you're going to see for most, like from a semifinal perspective. Every semifinal that I've seen, looked at, heard at is those six events. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You have a morning event and then an afternoon event. And it's two events per day for three days, yeah. which still is not an absurd amount of volume. You just have to be fit enough to place high. I mean, if you go to semifinals, like the intensity is through the roof. Like you still yeah. have to, like, you can't just sandbag it for two events and be like, I'm going to punch my ticket to the CrossFit games. You're right. not. Um, and so you still have to, like the intensity is the variable that doesn't change. Yeah. You have to be able to hit that level of intensity. And again, the, the level of intensity you has to hit corresponds with the level of competitor you're striving to be yep. if you're looking to do really well in a local competition your intensity will match that if you're looking to qualify for semifinals the intensity needs to kind of ratchet up a little bit more because you need to be able to push that envelope and and you know do do things incredibly fast and, and mm -hmm. handle that mm -hmm. but it's like if you're going to semifinals then you can start looking at like you know your vo your extra volume in your training program being that second third met kind of day mm -hmm. but then they're still using accessory work like that if you see someone like post on instagram you look at their whiteboard and you're like wow that's a lot of volume like was uh pat bellner i saw this one i posted a thing and it was like he's like morning session it was like a b c d e f like mm -hmm. different parts on paper looks like a lot what you're what people kind of like are failing to recognize the fact that like included in those six things on a whiteboard mm -hmm. one of them is like just a general warmth that just says hop on the bike for 10 minutes, get some blood yeah. flow going through there. Yeah. The second part is his activation stuff. Do three rounds of some hip halo side steps and some hollow mm -hmm. holds and some empty bar good mornings. Once yeah. you've gone through activation, now you're going to back squat. And that's kind of first training piece, right? Back squat five by three at 80%. Fantastic. Check. Awesome. Then you have your workout specific warm up. Hey, you're going to go through three rounds of 10 empty bar thrusters and mm -hmm. 10 ring rows and I don't know, 30 second sprint on the bike, something, I don't know, get your heart rate up. Then you're going to do Fran. You're going to do thrusters and pull-ups 
There's your second training piece. And the last thing on the whiteboard is some accessory. You're going to do some rear foot elevated split squats and some plank holds and good to go. Yep. It's like, that's the session. In actuality, he's done one lifting piece yep. and one Metcon. Yep. And those are the kind of training pieces that he's done. It looks like a lot on paper on the whiteboard because you see a whole bunch of marker and A through F pieces. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much volume in there. It's not all Metcons. It's yeah. not it. Um, again, because the people that are doing it the best understand what's being asked of them at the level they're competing at. And they're training for that test. Again, they're not doing five, six Metcons a day. They're doing one to two. And then the supporting strength work, accessory work. And like, that's kind of how they're filling in the gaps. Like, it's not like you're just doing, if you're that level, you're doing like two Metcons a day and just call it a day. You're doing your two training pieces and then some accessory and then, you know, maybe some strength work. You're kind of like filling in those gaps. It's how they kind of like accumulate what looks like absurd volume on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's so not what I hear you the saying, amount of volume then, it seems to be. Well, so what I hear you saying then is regardless of how much volume it looks like when it comes down to it, mm -hmm. it sounds like intensity is the way to results. Yeah, it's no. weird, isn't it? That's, That's amazing. Shocker. Sounds ridiculous. It's shocker. Um, yeah. But so again, it, if you're that athlete, that's, you know, that's whatever your level you're aspiring to get to. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of recap the thing. You start with just adding in some low intensity accessory, yeah. get a pump with your friends, work on some muscle group stuff to kind of strengthen things up. And it will make, mm -hmm. it'll make your body feel better. It'll make it help you move better. It'll Absolutely. keep your joints and tissues healthier in the mm -hmm. long term. Absolutely. From there, you start to layer in some low intensity skill work. Yep. As you're going through, there should be a mix of that throughout the week. Maybe on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you do some low intensity skill work. On Tuesday and Saturday, you do some accessory work. Yep. Balance that out across the week. Mm -hmm. Then you start to add in the capacity or the strength work. Again, it should still be varied. It's not that every day you're doing a lift and a skill and an accessory and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Do your main training piece, strength, strength piece on Monday. Mm -hmm. training piece accessory piece on tuesday training piece capacity piece on wednesday yes. you know training piece maybe another strength piece on friday training piece accessory piece on saturday like vary that stuff up you know we want to try and keep with the variance it doesn't have to be strength all the time or capacity all the time um and then that's where i would stay for you know to maybe like if, if that's feeling good and you're like doing the whole thing then what you can do is maybe like your alternator vary up your strength your capacity and your skill work mm -hmm. and then the third thing you do each day is you tack on some low intensity accessory work and like that's your third thing training piece yeah for the day and yeah. that is the most that i would recommend for the 99.99 percent .99 of people that mm -hmm. aren't competing at the crossfit games i would even i would still just me as a coach if i was working with an athlete that like hey i'm a semi-finals level athlete awesome for 99 percent of your year you're doing this because we're building your intensity and capacity through your main training piece we're building up any weaknesses be it strength capacity or skill that we need through that extra piece and the accessory work keeps you healthy allows you to like, you know, maybe if you're smaller, I think you need to put on some muscle, whatever it is that allows you to kind of like address that there. Once you've qualified, and I think here's something that people need to really think about. Once you've qualified for your competition that might be requiring extra volume, you've qualified for semifinals, you've qualified for Waterpalooza, insert competition here, your multi-day, multi-part competition, then once you've qualified for that, then you train for the test. Uh, if you know what your is going to be asked of you, you know, I qualify for granite games. That's my semifinal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing two events per day for three days. Awesome. Then what you do is you train for that. Yeah. Your training week might shift around, but then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're going to do your two events your two training pieces on those three days you're going to rest on monday tuesday wednesday looks just like a normal training day you're going to do your training piece your weakness work your accessory on tuesday wednesday rest thursday and then friday saturday sunday again it's kind of like i like to think of it as like event simulation um 
where you program workouts that might look like the events you might see, um, but they're more like your, your Metcons, your tests, right? Mm -hmm. If you haven't qualified for that competition, but you're doing multiple Metcons per day, because you, again, you think it's going to be a shortcut to fitness, to use James' words, the fool's errand, just adding mm -hmm. on that extra volume to try and get there. It's like, unless you've gotten there, unless you've qualified, unless you're, you know, unless you have the requisite intensity, you can't play. Yeah. So those are things that kind of like, I think that kind of gets lost on some people is like, unless you've qualified for that event, yeah. you're putting the cart before the horse. If you're trying to train for something that you haven't qualified for, because you can't reach the requisite amount of intensity to qualify for it. Right. And all the qualifying processes, whether it's an online qualifier for Waterpalooza or the opening quarterfinals, they're all tests of relative low volume intensity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And to recount, the open is one test over the course of seven days. Yeah. It's laughably low volume. Yeah. Quarterfinals is one test per day for four days, yep. which still looks a lot like a normal training week mm -hmm. for most people. You don't need more than that to prepare for that. You need to be prepared to, to die in that one test. Yeah. And then once you've reached a level of intensity, and again, that's where kind of like the weakness work, the working on your strength, the capacity, whatever, you can kind of like start to button up those holes and weaknesses mm -hmm. to support the level of intensity, right? If you're not strong enough to power clean 225, then when power clean the 225 show up in quarterfinals, you won't be able to maintain the requisite intensity mm -hmm. to get the score you need. So doing that strength work, improving your power clean will then allow you to, it's not just strength for strength sense, mm -hmm. it's being strong enough that you can maintain the requisite amount of intensity under load. Yeah. And then once you can do that, then you've qualified for your semifinal. And now you've earned the right to play. You know, but it's just like a lot of people put the cart before the horse in that. So that's all I got. Yeah. Well, and I think I think we can talk a number of different ways. You know, about the virtues and the and the. It's a lot of fun to do this stuff. It's a lot of fun to and, you know, fun. again going back to this is for so many people. This is their happy hour, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of an experience, it's fun to train with your friends, mm -hmm. right? And so for those of you out there who are listening to this and you're like, these jabronis are just telling me not to do the thing that I love, not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to last week, we're asking you to ask yourself, why are you doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is, I like to train with my friends. You know, this is our happy hour. We like to get after it. You know, we come, we take a class, but, you know, we've got an extra hour afterward. We don't want to go home. Yeah. We want to do something mm -hmm. else. Okay, cool. If I, yeah, I put my responsible coach hat on, I'm going to tell you to do something you're bad at, right? Yep. And don't do it for reps or for speed or for time. Yep. You know, if you want to get stronger in your pull-ups, don't do an EMOM of 10 pull-ups. Right. Give me three sets of 30-second chin over bar hold. Oh. Right? Like... <sighs> You like talk about yeah. something that is super unsexy, but will mm -hmm. move the needle, right? So that's an example oh, of something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Find a way if you and if you're unsure of how to go about this, mm -hmm. talk to a coach. Yep. Talk, talk to a coach and talk, say, talk, yep. And, and tell, lay it all out. I want to train with my friends. We want to do something fun. I want it to be a little bit more, but I don't want to cook myself, right? Because yep. we're always going to be still asking for that intensity mm -hmm. in those single workouts of the day. Yep. And I so, think when, when all is said and done, it's not the worst thing in the world. And again, there's a whole bunch of nuance to this. And we've talked about, you know, the avenue of like really trying to support a goal of, you know, trying to maybe, whether it's improve your placement in the open, qualify for quarterfinals, local competitions, you know, even qualifying for semifinals, like that path there, like ways we can support that. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to, I just really enjoy this. And that's why I train more. It's not really for any competitive goal. Like I might throw my hat in the ring or I'll sign up for the open, just, you know, be part of the community and have a giggle. But I'm, I'm really just, I, I enjoy spending more time in the gym because I really enjoy it. Yeah. I think the, you know, 
we've said like, you know, try and avoid doing like that second Metcon each day. Again, it's not the worst thing in the world. If you're like, Hey, on a Saturday, you go in and you take a class with your friends. Then afterwards you're like, Hey, let's do something else stupid because we can, um, like that kind of stuff can be fun. You know, it can be, a, it can be so much it, fun. It, it can be so much fun so that it, you know, we're not saying that if you're training more than this, you're an idiot. Or if yeah. you're, you know, or that if you, if you just really enjoy every once in a while, chucking a second Metcon in there because you like to throw down with your friends and have at it. And, yeah. and as long as you're not injuring yourself or injuring other people or just smashing yourself into the ground for, mm-hmm. for no reason, mm-hmm. all's good in the hood. Like if, if you're like, Hey, you know, every Saturday, you know, we, we train as normal and responsible adults throughout the week. Then on Saturdays, we're like, let's get loose we're gonna do cindy rest five minutes and do cindy again it's like just right. because you know yeah. we just enjoy doing it we love throwing down with our friends we love that's hands. awesome yeah just, well <laughs> bad example cindy to cindy but you sure. get what i'm saying yeah. like we're gonna do one workout rest a little bit do another workout just because we really enjoy it yeah. that's perfectly fine i think the detriment sure. comes when you think you have to do that every day mm-hmm. either just to be fit or to try and reach whatever competition goals you need. If you think that's what you need to do, a little bit misguided maybe, but if it's something that you want to do because you're like, I just really enjoy throwing down with my friends and having fun and whatever it is, then mm-hmm. completely fine. And I think that's where the distinction is, is, is I, I'm doing it because I want to and I enjoy it versus I think I need to. Yeah, you think that's so, going to move the needle somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, I think... I think, you know, obviously we could spend a lot of time going down this rabbit hole even more so, but I think Mm -hmm. we've done a good job of kind of rounding out the big picture. When it comes to adding additional volume, there are some some intelligent ways to do it. Um, There are also some ways that are going to be detrimental to your fitness, but as always, we encourage you to figure out what your goals are and then to be responsible in seeking out ways to achieve those goals. Um, any any burning desires? Anything you want to <clears throat> say on the topic before we cap this bad boy off? Not really. I think just like final thought would be like before you start considering adding on volume, like just mm-hmm. make sure you move well first. Like make sure your mechanics are solid. Make sure they're consistent, and you, everything's good to go there. Because then you're just going to be healthier, more efficient, less injured going down the road. And being injured is not fun. It's, no. it's not a fun time. I'm not having fun right now. I, <laughs> uh, so take it from me as yeah. someone who's been there, yeah. dove down the volume hole when I didn't really deserve it. And then now here I am um, dealing with said consequences. So that would just be my final thought and recommendation for everyone is just make sure movement mechanics wise, you're solid and good to go before you start tacking on extra volume. Beautiful. I think it's, yeah. a, I think it's a great sentiment. I echo it entirely. Um, so I don't, I don't feel the need to add anything. Uh, so I'd say if you made it this far into the episode, thank you for listening and or watching. Hopefully it was useful. Next week, we're going to come back with something completely different. Uh, and hopefully it's as or more entertaining uh, between now and then. As always, Kevin, thank you for sticking this out with me. I really appreciate what we're doing here. Oh, always. Love it. Yeah. All right, everybody. We will chit-chat with you next week. See us. See ya.